This is the official podcast for season two of the HBO documentary series, 100 Foot Wave. I'm your host, Nicole McNamara. If you just watched episode four, you definitely know me a lot better now because you see me in the most vulnerable moments a human could ever have. You see me very sick, crying a lot, and then you get to see me birth a baby. There was a lot going on and I was out of it. I had no idea where Garrett was. I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know what the waves were doing. I definitely wasn't on the cliff spotting, which is why Garrett's joining me now. So I can actually find out what he was so preoccupied with during that time. What was happening during episode four? Like during my birth and when I was really sick, I wasn't out in, in the world knowing what was happening with the contest. and Well, there was a lot of moving parts for the event. They uh, wanted to invite different people and I had to make the calls. And there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. There's the surfer's opinion. There's my opinion and the other people who are responsible for WSL. So the WSL, the World Surf League, is home of all surf competition and they made the decisions and then had me make the calls at the end of the day i really don't have any say i'm just a, a soundboard they bounce things off of you are the fall guy basically. everybody throws me under the bus and i just take it <laughs> one thing i picked up on even though i missed a lot was the situation of tony not getting invited into the contest because it was pretty hard to miss he was devastated and pretty upset and pretty upset with you. What's your take on that? Like, why wasn't Tony invited? Okay, I talked to Tony earlier that year, and I, I talked to him a few times. I said, look, if you want to get an event, you got to prove that you can drive. And that was like three years ago I, I shared that with him. And then the next day I go out, he's paddling. The next day I go out, he's paddling. The day after that I go out, he's paddling, paddling, paddling. I, no driving, so I was like, okay. And then the year after, he's getting towed, but he's not towing. So again, I can't see if he can drive. And I'm asking Pitbull, can he drive? And Pitbull's like, I don't know. So um, it was sad that he didn't get in the event. You know, his surfing wasn't quite there and his driving, we didn't know. The whole world's trying to get in this event and there's only six teams, only 12 people from the whole entire world get in. So it's really challenging to choose who gets in. And the surfing, the level of surfing right now is way beyond what it was. There's so many guys that actually deserve to be in the event. There's numerous times when I said, should I take this role on again this year? I, is it necessary? Yeah, for what? Well, I, the number one, I want to do safety. I want everybody to survive. Yeah. So I was full on focused on safety. Number two, I want it to be fair for the athletes because I was that guy who didn't get in. I was Tony. I do feel a deep sense of responsibility to help nurture whatever happens in Nazareth because Nazareth is my baby. You know, we've talked in private about this a little bit, but I mean, it's very clear throughout the episode that I really needed you and you were on your phone as we all saw. So I was alone. Uh, they only filmed. Yeah, they only. Yeah, that's just once. <laughs> so you feel that was an inaccurate representation? 50% accurate. 50% accurate. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to change your percentage? One more chance to change your 75 percent. 75% accurate. No, 25. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at me on the phone is, I'm not proud of that. I was gone during the event and leading up to the event, I was kind of gone, always preoccupied and always working on something and thinking back. I probably could have not been on the phone at least half of the time and still done as good or a better job than I did. And I could have done a lot better job of of being present with you. I was really confident that Carl was such an amazing friend. and Carl Sandrock, our videographer who lives in our house. I, I knew that when I wasn't there, he would be. So I was really, I felt really good about that. But it would have been much better to be present and be there as myself. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Before Beryl was born, Garrett and I had never spent more than one day apart. 
and we traveled everywhere together. I mean, it was just a rule. And then I became pregnant with Beryl and Garrett was very concerned that our life was going to change and me never having a child. I was like, oh no, Garrett, everything's going to stay the same. We're still going to go everywhere together. And... You know, I think we actually did we, a Barrow, pretty, we did. pretty good job of that. Barrel had 150 airplanes by one year old. It's true. Barrel just went everywhere with us. At, I mean, at two years old, he'd probably been to so many business meetings with his little art pack. And he was just the best little Buddha baby who'd just sit there through any meeting, through anything. He traveled everywhere. You know, if they want Garrett, but they don't want us, then we're not doing it. The kids came to the meetings. It wasn't disrespectful. It's just this is it. Even still today. You know, I went to every swell. I was on the boat at Jaws, pregnant. I was pregnant out at Cortez. Fiji, Tahiti. There, yeah. From the beginning, it's not just my dedication. It's also Garrett's dedication to our partnership, to our teamwork. And I think maybe that's why I did feel so alone because, you know, we often like to do joke to each other when we don't like something that's happening in our relationship. We say, I didn't sign up for that. Because I'm just so used to you being so attentive and I'm used to you being so not concerned, but so caring, caring, careful with me. And whenever I'm in a time of need, I'm used to you being there for me. So that's what I signed up for. And I felt in that situation that wasn't what I signed up for, you know. That was unfortunately a time that you were really caught up in in something that was important to you. And I do acknowledge that, that you were very vested in your job, but I'm used to being your priority. And in that situation, I wasn't your priority. So I think that just compounded my hurt a little bit more. But it it was the hardest thing I've ever had to endure. Yeah, that it it pretty much only told half of the story and half of the challenges that we went through and uh yeah your mother getting pneumonia and she was close to dying and we had to rush her to hospital and ambulance and that was the reason she wasn't with you while you were having the baby with us she she flew all the way from hawaii to help take care of us when we had COVID. And then she gets pneumonia. We go upstairs and she's almost practically she was you know, dead. She's close she was to like death. Dead, yeah. yeah, she couldn't move. She was delirious. She didn't know where she was. She couldn't stand up. Yeah, so it shows you saying you want your mom. Well, I was crying hysterically. Yeah, since we've been together, you've cried. I've seen you cry about at the most five times in the last 12 years. And during your pregnancy, you cried, broke down 10 to 20 times. After the COVID, you got a rare liver condition called cholestasis. Well, one thing that for me is really not shown, and it seems like not that big of a deal, but when you look up cholestasis, one of the symptoms, like the number one s symptom, the only way it really ever gets diagnosed in these pregnancies is it causes suicidal itching. <laughs> like it's characterized by suicidal itching, like the itching in your body is so bad, it drives people to want to kill themselves. What you're supposed to do for cholestasis is you're supposed to induce by 36 weeks, number one, to stop the itching, and number two, to prevent fetal demise. So most women just go into the hospital 36 weeks, get induced, and it's done. Uh, so the itching, like to lay there with that itching, and the thing was we just had COVID, and from the coughing and from the weight of the baby, when I had COVID, my back went out. It didn't just go out. She could not stand up. Yeah, I couldn't up. walk. Couldn't my, stand up. Before my mother went to the hospital, Garrett and my mother, literally the two of them, had to carry this nine-month pregnant lady to the bathroom and back. Like, literally, physically pick me up and, you and carry crying. me. You and I would cry the, the whole time because of the pain from my back. And then throw on some itching on top of that. Then it went The day way of up. the contest. It went way up. When you went to do what you had to do i went with thea by myself to get blood work done and the results came in during the award ceremony of the contest and that's the day that the labs just shot up to an unsafe speed of demise potential yeah, high high potential level and it was like demise. i have to have this baby right now or you know she might not be alive when she's born 
So I rushed back. My whole thing was I wanted the baby to be able to be born on her terms when she wanted to be born. I birthed all my babies at home. You know, that desire to be connected to nature and trust my own body is super important. And how many weeks early was it? Well, she was due on Christmas Day. And we had her on December 15th. So just 10 days. We made it pretty far. Yeah. So the baby's born and she's healthy and beautiful and perfect. And I mean, for me, when watching the episode, the scene right after when you're holding the baby and I'm on the bed, like you can just see in my face the the relief that everyone's alive. And interestingly enough, this moment the baby was born, the itching just miraculously went away. So that was great. And it's very hard to name a child with Garrett. <laughs> I think the only easy one was Beryl. You know, we had some names picked out, but nothing that we were both totally in love. Do you remember what we were thinking before we we came on to Faye? Thea wanted strawberry. Well, oh, yes. Okay. So my whole pregnancy, Thea, Thea the four-year-old, was insisting that this baby's name be Strawberry. And I like that one. She told everybody. And then there's this 20-foot statue of a strawberry at the doctor's that I had to go to every day. And where will you find a 20-foot statue in the world of, of a strawberry? A strawberry. <laughs> in no. the middle of this very small village in Portugal. In the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere. Crazy. Next to the cows. Her name ended up being Fe Domar Strawberry Lucy. And Fe is faith in Portuguese and Domar is the sea. So faith of the sea. So I chose faith because, I mean, honestly, if somebody were asked me, what do you have faith in? I had faith in myself. I had faith in my intuition. I had faith in my body. I had, a, yeah, I had faith in, in my decisions in that I was doing the right thing. And I had to have faith in her as well, in the baby, that we could do this together. And I do. I feel that, you know, I said that I was all alone, but really I wasn't all alone. She was with me. Like it was Faye and I getting through that together. And then I also like that. It's spelled F-E, which is iron on the periodic table of elements. So my science background, I really <laughs> love that, you know, she's also as strong as iron. Do you, do you think this, that whole experience, the COVID and then the cholestasis and the birth, do you feel it changed us at all? Strengthened us, weakened us? Definitely strengthened. I mean, can't get much stronger than our beginning, but... You know, things get a little more challenging and they seem to be a lot more strength. Yeah, a lot more strength in our relationship these days. I know sometimes if you tell me or I tell you, you know, that everything happens for a reason or, you know, you can choose to think of it differently. We get really frustrated at each other in the moment. But I do think our awareness of how it is a choice, how we feel about certain things I think that's really what gets us through a lot of uncomfortable moments is our ability to know that at the end of the day, everything is a choice and how we feel is a choice. And yeah. We love the choices or yeah. let them make, make us toxic and by dwelling in the negative. What's the most important thing you want people to know about our relationship? It's like a fairy tale. It's... um. A dream come true. I was always dreaming of the perfect woman and you just appeared into my life at a time when I least expected it. And yeah, I knew. We're just so lucky. I am just so grateful every day. I mean, I'm like, pinch, pinch me. Is this real? Am I really living this life? Am I really this lucky? Why? So at time, I used to always think, why me? Why am I so lucky? Why Why do I get all this special attention? Why do I get all this? Why do I get all that? Um, it's all because of our union, our relationship. It's just, 
so special and and when we're really present with each other and really being there for each other doing for each other what each other's looking for it's just electric it's um it's i don't know it's just so special and captivating in the early days of garrett and i uh we were in a restaurant waiting to pick up some food and this guy comes up to us and he's like are you we were in los angeles so that explains it but are you two in town to put on a love convention because (laughs) i'll sign up right now (laughs) (laughs) everything that i wanted to be and be like you were and i always said that if only the world could see through Nicole's eyes, it would be a much better place. Well, if you guys really want to get behind the scenes, everyone listening, we are actually recording this podcast in our laundry room, and it's very hot. (laughs) So I just want to thank you, Garrett, for entertaining me and coming and sitting here in the laundry room and talking to me about, you know, sometimes relationships are uncomfortable and I appreciate you coming with your openness and willingness to talk about the hard stuff, but also celebrate the beauty. So I love you. and Thanks for chatting. Well, I'm just super proud of you and just all those challenges that you endured and all the protocols that you went through and stuck to and researched and implemented and and again, endured all those teas and all those different meals and all everything that you had, you chose to do that enabled our baby to come out healthy and strong. I love you. A lot happened behind the scenes a lot happened that doesn't get shown in episode four so I'm actually going to sit down with Carl Sandrock our videographer who lives in our house he is responsible for shooting verite which verite is the in-between moments of the action so he's not responsible for filming the big waves or any of those crazy action scenes He captures the real moments between our family and between Garrett and I. And for me, he captures the beautiful moments, the gold, as Carl likes to say. Hi, Carl. Hello, Nicole. So nice to talk to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know how busy you are. You just returned from the tundra. Yep. (laughs) Building igloos and living in the snow. So I really appreciate you carving out a little bit of time to talk about episode four, the famous episode. (laughs) At the beginning, it opens up with Garrett and I in Iceland. We were there filming with Tule. It was for a commercial. Garrett and I were there as ambassadors, and you were there on the filming crew, which is when we actually first met you. What did you think of Garrett? What were your first thoughts? Well, I could feel that he's an athlete in the matter of body language, but also a little bit of the vibe that is different. From the beginning, I really felt that he sticks out from the average and from, from the people I'm surrounded. Other athletes, he really, yeah, he's, he's unique. But same to you, because I met you at the same time as Garrett, and I didn't know who Garrett was, and same, same for you. Mm-hmm. And I believe I, I, I even then started to feel and connect much more with you, Beryl, and Garrett. We start, start to talk a little more regarding today and yeah the future (laughs) yeah i remember you know garrett being garrett he was oh do you want to come to nazare and film and so you had only met us twice in november we called you up and we said we have covid (laughs) our one filmer had to leave us so here we were in portugal in a very vulnerable time they just gave garrett a gopro and they said you film everything so that scene in episode four where I'm just coughing my lungs out and 
I look at the camera and I say, just leave me alone. It's actually Garrett that I'm saying that to because he had this GoPro and the whole time I'm just dying. He's got this GoPro in my face asking me how I feel. So, and then Garrett tests negative. I finally test negative and the producer called us up and said, we need to replace your filmer. So who do you guys want? And I said, how about Carl and Ola from Sweden? How did that idea pop up? Like, <laughs> how, how, how did that, yeah, that connection? <laughs> uh, well, well, I was going to ask you why you said yes. <laughs> because the thing was, was you've never shot verite. You've never shot reality of following somebody around in their life. You've definitely never signed up for living with relative strangers and documenting everything they do you know it isn't your norm so yeah what made you say yes carl new challenges for sure new challenges in the matter of coming from a different environment where i work with different teams but still we have a structure to be offered a project like this where i jump into your shoes in the matter of your life, your problems, your happiness, your sadness, the roller coaster of, of, of life. Yeah, you literally just walk into this situation with this very pregnant woman and this major health condition. So after I tested negative for COVID, all of a sudden my body just started itching, like the most crazy itching. I didn't have one spot anywhere on me, but for some reason, like the soles of my feet, the palms of my hands, my head, my back, just everything was so itchy. And being the positive person that I am, I just thought it was my body detoxing the virus. And, you know, if I just drank a lot of water and took hot showers, you know, my body would get rid of it and I would stop itching. But I don't like to let fear enter me. But I called my midwives. I had multiple at this point. And yep, they're like, you definitely have what's called cholestasis so it's essentially when your liver shuts down it's a super rare condition it affects about one percent of pregnant women that's kind of when my world collapses uh, as you're showing up that was in some intense uh, period of time and yeah being thrown into the entire situation once again I didn't know what was going on and same with COVID and wow, yeah. I'm happy you're here, Nicole. It was the insane period of time. What has been your greatest challenge in documenting our life? My greatest challenge has for sure been uh, time. Accepting that this is my life and enjoying it because before meeting you, all of you guys, time was quite important. Structure, knowing my next step, my next move. And yeah, this, your, this family is just the complete opposite. It's just as free as it can be. Time, of course, means different for different uh, family members um, of yours. I think what you might be referring to is that for all my listeners out there, a little insight into my my brilliant husband, Garrett, is that time doesn't really exist to Garrett. <laughs> yeah, it's a little extra challenge yeah. for me, of course, waking up and expecting. But <laughs> but yeah, it's just trying to find him because <laughs> Nazare, it's quite small. So it's always quite fun morning hunt for Garrett. But yeah, I quite <laughs> easily know where he hides. <laughs> It's, it's a fun project. I'm growing so much and understanding different rhythm because of this non-time existing. <laughs> Just going with the flow and he ends up on the beach with beautiful sunrise and meeting old uh, fishermen on the harbor <laughs> that has been there in the beginning. I guess, yeah, spontaneity is the spice of life. <laughs> mm hmm Oh, yeah. And that was one of the things about Garrett that I fell in love with, you know, and now it's one of the things that, you know, I have to manage. But, yeah, that freedom of just doing anything, anytime, because 
the world is your oyster. That's yeah. That's a big, big lesson I've taken in uh, understanding that things changes from day to day, and let's make the best out of today, this moment, and seeing the McNamara's uh, lifestyle. It also changes my lifestyle for a better, and understanding that everything is not about yeah. Being so structured and being so squared, go a little bit outside of the box, and if you manifest the good stuff, it will bring just positivity out of yeah. it. So more good, good stuff. It's funny, something that has shifted in Garrett. So back in the very beginning, you know, he would always say, "Do not turn the camera off to whoever was filming. Like film all day long, film everything." And now there's been this shift, and I know you've noticed it too, Carl. Where there's moments like, "Oh, I don't want to be filmed," or "or stop filming," or something like that. And I know he's been on my case a lot about not getting upset with him in front of the camera. <laughs> and I'm like, "No, that's not what I signed up for. I signed up for being myself all the time. That's the only way I can do this. Is if there's no filter." So you're there in these really intimate moments between a husband and a wife. You're like the third partner in our marriage. So how is that for you when you know you can see the tension growing between Garrett and I? It's like how is that for you? It's a mix of feelings. <laughs> Being in that environment, in that situation, in between both of you, in yeah, everything from really really happy moments, intimate moments, but also heavy moments where you don't know what's going to happen. In the beginning of our relationship, the the entire family, <laughs> of course, uh, learning each individual and understanding their space, understanding when it's the right time to record and which angles, because you can always shoot from a very discreet and very incognito angle, but you can also be very present and have a big rig and I've, I've yeah it's been a roller coaster but I felt from the beginning that I was really accepted and the chemistry was re really good and I believed that the more time I would spend with the family and put a little extra effort that would just bring an even better dynamic and for me even better content but of course I'm not yeah nowadays I'm not only there for 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 shooting I'm also there yeah being part of the family and yeah, growing as well uh, part of it so yeah it's a big it's a big journey during all of this you know it's very little is shown on episode four but you see just enough but you do see that Garrett is very preoccupied with the contest and behind the scenes Carl you were the one who went to every appointment with me you are the one who drove with me for hours in the car hours we spent hours in the car you've you went to all my appointments you were there every time my blood work came in and the levels weren't what I wanted them to be I mean you saw me break down numerous times the title of episode four is called partners and for me my memory and my reality is that you were my partner in this situation because then my mother ends up getting pneumonia. So now I don't even have my mother and my husband is just in big wave la la land and you were the, you were there. Yeah. So much things was going on and understanding the dynamic of the contest that Garrett was putting a lot of time and a lot of energy into. But then you being home with the kids, on top of all of all this, having two kids in that age, and then your mother became sick, really sick, and that you, Nicole, appreciated me more than just a cameraman. Shooting a heavy time of your life gives me a lot of gratitude because I believe we had the opportunity to open up much more go much more personal and uh, I really believed in you for the good that you were gonna recuperate and you're gonna proceed being a very good mother as you are. Were there any moments for you Carl where you knew you needed to be filming but you 
wished you could put the camera down and be more in the actual moment? Yes. I believe that's everyday thoughts or a challenge, understanding how much should I confront. A couple of times I really felt that I wanted to show the world really what was going on and the decisions you chose to take, Nicole. For me, it was quite yeah, a good message to, to share. And I really felt that it was a good time to, to record, but then seeing you in such a pain or not knowing what was going on with your blood work, your liver, and really what was going on with your body, because you, you listen to your body, you, you're very connected to your body. And that was scary, not knowing what was going on, but also powerful. What was it like filming the birth for you? Because I believe that was your first birth. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> no kids yet. Being with you before the birth and during the birth, it was mixed feelings. It was so much going on. Um, your mother being a very strong individual and very strong anchor in the family, she was not there. And I really... Uh, felt that you and Faye had really been struggling for a long time and delivering Faye, being surrounded in a circle with your family. It was a very, very special, very special moment in my life as well. And yeah, seeing Faye <laughs> uh, was beautiful. And it all worked out, thank God. <laughs> yeah, we all believed in you and you knew that there was just one way out and it was yeah. delivering a healthy baby and you did it and you're, you're healthy as well. So yeah, it was amazing, but intense, very intense. Yeah, it was definitely the hardest time of my life for sure. And, you know, I even said at one point, well, maybe... I'm not meant to have this baby, you know, like that definitely, you know, went through my mind like, okay, do I have to prepare myself that maybe this baby isn't going to be alive, you know, and how am I going to be okay with that? And uh, I couldn't have done it without all the people who stepped up and supported me and believed in, you know, my path of listening to my body and letting nature take its course. You know, even the Western doctor who, who let me sneak into his office so he could give Faye the stress test, you know, like how amazing was that guy yep. like to to let me do that over and over again and kept saying, oh, yeah, she's good. I'm still OK with you following your path. You know, and this is from a very mm -hmm. conservative Portuguese man who also believed in the power of the human body and of nature. So... You were there for after Faye's birth for everything, for all the postpartum fun. You really got to see what it means to be a, a mother. Yes, <laughs> and, I um, You know, I felt like you were very connected to Faye even before she was born, since you spent so much time, you know, you got to listen to her in the belly and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I ended up asking you to be her godfather her guide parent <laughs> and uh, you accepted um how did that feel or were you surprised or i was definitely quite surprised because first of all you presented it in a quite uh, yeah nice way but also unusual way for me that both garrett and you came up to me uh, in front of the of the house of Hawaii um, and asked like, yeah, we have a serious question. And I was like, oh, okay, now something is going on. Um, and yeah, then you asked and of course, yeah, and I'm really so excited just because being connected now to the family even more, being able to continue seeing her in her life, Beryl and Thea as well. I'm just super happy and super grateful for being asked if I want to be the godfather for Faye. Well, I really appreciate your openness and uh, having this conversation with me. Thank you, Nicole. 
and I look forward to many years of living outside the box. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes, and continuing this amazing journey and I'm being here with you guys because I wanna show people that you can live outside of the certain norms or bubble or structure and still be a very successful family. The next couple of months for you guys look super exciting and hopefully I'm gonna be there shooting it, documenting it. You will be. I'm just grateful. <laughs>out of the plexiglass back here. And I wrote, this one, sh this one still moves. This one kind of like came back. This one's broken and these three are here. And when I say broken, it's just a tip. But I was like spitting out all these fucking pieces of teeth and it went through my lip. My tongue would come out like here. Went to the hospital, got stitches and like, the stitches they put inside are supposed to go away, never did. So when they got infected, it lasted like six months, man. Laurent will join me on the podcast next week, along with big wave surfer Tony Lorano. This has been the official podcast for HBO's 100 Foot Wave. I'm your host, Nicole McNamara. Remember, episodes air every Sunday at 8 p.m. Then join me right after for this podcast. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to chatting next week.